If you imagine Jerusalem has been built on a very high mountainside, which made it really almost impregnable to enemy attack. It was called the fortress of the city of Zion. Uh, so when the pilgrims and the people of God went from wherever they were in their rural areas up to Jerusalem to the festival, it could be any festival, the festival of Passover or festival of harvest, which we think about today, they would sing these songs as they moved along. They journey. You know, a bit like uh, people in the military do, you know, they sing songs as they kind of march along, don't they? The first world war was not most lynched and launched on some of them. Pack of it in your own kit bag. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. That was a, a, a similar idea. That wherever the people of God were, in the journey up to Jerusalem, in order to encourage them, in order to strengthen themselves, they would sing these songs and sounds. They probably would know them. And they would probably have each song for each psalm and for each occasion. This is a psalm of harvest. Psalm 126 says, When the Lord brought back the captive to Zion, we were like men and women who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap the songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. That is the harvest of him, isn't it? Carrying sheaves of corn and life with him to the great celebration there. Now I'm going to run through this psalm, just pick out key elements which reminds us of God's goodness towards us. Harvest is an opportunity when we take in the time of the year to say thank you to God for being our creator, being our sustainer, and being our example giver, the life giver as well. We've got the first word here is rescue. This song, as they sing, they look back to the time when God delivered them from captivity in Babylon. They've been sent to Babylon because of their weakness, their sin, their failure, their rebellion, their idolatry to God, and they've been taken captives from Jerusalem to the great empire of Babylon, to the great capital city, and they've stayed there as an exiled people for seven years. Generation and that was people. And then when they came back, and it was an act of God that brought them back. It was a man called Cyrus, who was a king and the leader of the Assyrian Empire that knocked off the Babylonians. And Isaiah said some years before as Cyrus was born, that he will be my servant to bring my people back to Jerusalem. Back to Israel. This is God. This is God with a purpose, God with a plan, God with an ordering of doing things. And so when they came back, they came back to recognize they had been rescued. When the Lord brought back captives and restored the fortunes of Zion, this is a song of rescue. This is a song of rescue. And in a sense, this song reminds us what God gives to his people. People like you and me, people who have fallen away from God, who find ourselves estranged from God, we find that God doesn't just abandon us and say, well, you've made your bed, you lie in it. I'm going to come and rescue your my people. He said to the Jeep people of Israel in Egypt, said, I have heard my I have seen my people suffering, and I am coming down to help them. This is a God who gets involved. And here we have in the harvest thing, and these harvest gifts, the food bank and things like that, we're not the business of really helping people, 
or in dire situations, who need an absence sense of rescue in their lives. If people who just really struggle for a temporary situation to have difficulty mentioned on the video, a family or a gentleman who lost their job, how can I do it? What can I do? It may be somebody who's in so much debt that will never pay off that debt in their lifetime. That happens. People who in so much debt that will never be able to pay off in their lifetime. Imagine, imagine being rescued from that. This is a bit of a visible demonstration of that rescue as well. When the exiles came back from Babylon, we came back home, we came back to a place where they could live out again the promise of God. They would have their own land, a plot of land, they would have their own sea, they would have their own harvest, and they would bring that gift back to God as well. This is the rescuing God. So Israel had known for their songs of joy, for their songs, songs of celebration, for their songs of just dancing. So I can imagine the people walking up to Jerusalem, travelling from their rural areas, singing these songs and having a jolly good time. Just enjoy it. We could look at it and help us if we were enjoying what we were doing, couldn't we? Yeah, you know, it's called Smile. And we love it to sing that, isn't it? Our mouths were filled with laughter, says the psalmist, our tongues with songs of joy. But there was also relief as well, wasn't it? Relief. These people have said, When the Lord brought us back to the captives of Zion, we were like men who were dreaming. Get that sense of the sheer relief of being back home again, of being returned again, of being in the rightful place again. When Israel returns back to Palestine, Israel in 1948, they were well felt that relief. You know, 2,000 years of persecution in Europe, 200 years of persecution and problems in Russia and Northern Europe, feeling the immense insecurity. And then in 1948, and at the beginning of the century actually, Jews returning back to this land of promise. As if they were in a dream. That past, with all of those persecution problems, is now the past. The sense of relief that people might feel in that occasion. But there's not only rescue and there's not only relief as well, there's actually recognition in this passage as well. Verses 2 to 3. And the recognition is very, very powerful, isn't it? It says, Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Recognizing who is behind this amazing rescue, this amazing relief, this amazing torrent of rejoicing. Who is behind it? It's the Lord. There are two people who are speaking this song, two groups of humanity who speak. First, the nations around Israel, and also the people themselves. The, the, the nations say among themselves, the Lord has done great things for them. The great challenge for modern Israel is that they need to live up to this promise of God. And for the nations around them to be able to say of Israel in modern Israel, the Lord has done great things for them. They are meant to be a light to the nations. Bring people to the glory of God. That is a challenge of anyone who claims to be the Israel of God. It's a challenge for me and you as well. We're meant to be the light to this world. This world in darkness and sadness and weakness and failure, in need. To be just the candle where we are, burning wherever we can, is light in the world. And the reason we can do that is because we still follow him and say, I am this world's light. 
whoever follows me, says Jesus, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Because I know this one who will follow me, this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords, this answer to the hope not only of Israel, but the whole world. And for my need, I can find a way forward in life and maybe show you the people to that way and to recognize the way to myself and to others. Food Bank and the Coventry City Mission are ministries of presence in the world that need the presence of Jesus and the, the goodness of God. It's good to be good, isn't it? kind to be kind and in and of itself it's a beneficial activity but I know that this group here as they wrote their food bank on Fridays and also across the city centre these churches desire more than anything else that these acts of kindness in food will turn to acts of faith in Jesus to move from food to faith from making something practical to meeting people's need making something personal to meeting their need. Often we seem to have ourselves in Christianity and think, well, I'm a practical Christian and I'm a faith Christian. James had it in his letter and he says, well, I want to tell you, <laughs> if you have faith, show it by your action and your life. You know? We often make a distinction between that which is spiritual and that which is pr practical in the Christian life. I remember an old illustration which is so old now, but most of you won't know it, so I feel alright to use it again. In Hard Park in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Saint Park, Hard Park in Central London, we would have somewhere called Preacher's Corner. Right? I don't know where it was, Street Park, it could have been anywhere. You know, out in the middle of nowhere. And the regular preacher there was a lord called so Lord Soap. And he would get on his shiver, shiver box and started preaching away on the Christian faith. Not far away, there'd be the opposition they thought. You know, the, the National Socialist League or the Communist League and things like that. And he would be blasting out the joys and the benefits of socialism in Russia and things like that, doing great good. And they could hear each other speaking. And the crowds could hear him. And sometimes there'd be a banter between the two. And then one occasion the Communist Party noticed somebody who was very homeless, whose clothes were very tatty, and looked at the man and he said, that man, communism, will put a new clothes on that man. So poor as quickly as anything says, but actually Christianity put a new man in those clothes. That's the essential difference. Say, Christianity seeks to do both. Not either of them. It is both. It is from food to faith, from practice to making the life of Christ personal in our lives. When Jesus had a group of people in front of him, a bit larger than this group of people, I think it's about 4,000, out in the middle of nowhere on the hillsides of Judea, turned to one of his disciples and says, Feed these people, will you? Yeah. Let me test. What did one of them say? Jesus, what are you saying? We don't know we have enough money to feed these people forever and ever, ever. Jesus said, well, What have you got? And I don't wonder whether he might some kind of poor kid for his bread and his whatever it is, the fish. But it was given to him. And Jesus took that bread and that fish. He brought that small thing to God and he just blessed it in God's name and then just pulled the fish out and gave it to his disciples. Pulled the bread out and gave it to his disciples. And his disciples were God smart at what was happening. And he says, put your mouth down, close it up, feed the people. What was Jesus saying that you might not think you've got much? But with me, you've got more than you need to bless other people. I was listening to a retirement service this morning on Radio 4. Uh, Radio 4, and it was uh, on Tuesday, it's National um, 
I'm going to give that some work this week. I still enjoy it. All right. Uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. It's great service, lovely service. And one of the people who participated in this, he says, she says, you're never without purpose with God. For as long as you've got breath in your body, you have a purpose in the world. You can be kind, you can do good, you can say a word, and you can pray. You can turn your life to immense significance, to immense significance before God and before Him. But that wasn't the end of it. Jesus feeding 4,000, and then he did it again, later on, 5,000, just to show that it was the trick. Alright? And then he goes on to say, You come to me for food, you come to me for bread that has forever. I am the bread that brings life. Whoever feeds on me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Come to me. Jesus wants to bless us bless others through us. He wants to bless those who are bringing people to himself. So if you've been at this church for some time, if you've been at Food Bank as well, if you've been a volunteer, recognize you're doing great good for God's kingdom. But pray for the people who come into this room. But also if you've been coming here and you've not been coming here, the point is, come to Jesus. Feed you forever. Food to faith. In this psalm, we thought about rescue. God who saves and brings people back to Himself. In this psalm, we thought about rejoicing and relief. The God who gives us songs of joy in knowing Him. In this psalm, we thought about the one we need to recognize the God who has done great things for us. And finally, in this psalm, we find restoration done in verses 4 through to 6. It says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap the song to joy. Those who got weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheep with them. This is the promise. Actually, the psalm divides in two sections. And in this section, in the middle of verse 3, is a turning point. Verses 1 to 2, look at the past. What God has done, where it's brought, and it's called. Verse 4, look forward to the future. What God will do, and what will happen. They will reap. They will return the songs. We will rejoice in Him. This is how the goodness of God works out. That He not only gives us and deals with us, Failure and weakness in turning to Him gives us a future and a hope in Him. And that's a promise. A promise from God. James chapter 3, verse 18 says, Peace makers of sowing peace will reap the harvest of righteousness. You know, sometimes it is hard doing this. It mentions in verses 4 to 6 about sowing the tears. Not going out with weeping. That's hard, isn't it? I don't want to con you in believing that everything or much of the Christian life is just easy. It's not. We have some dudes with you who could be in that time of weeping, in that time of tears, in that time of sadness. And he will bring you through it. It will come. You will become a person who is with joy and looking to Him. God be with you as you do that in your hands. I'm going to sing a final song and then I'm going to pray. There's uh, 10,000 reasons to bless the Lord. And uh, remember, we've got tea and refreshments after this. And I believe.